Good afternoon, and welcome to today's IAC webinar, Design and Management of QC Procedures for SPECT and PET Equipment. My name is Kelly Baer, and I'm the Creative Design Manager with Marketing Communications at IAC. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to review a few technical matters and let you know how you can participate in today's session. We would like today's webinar to be interactive, so we encourage you to submit questions. To do so, use the questions tab located on the left side of your screen. Please submit your questions anytime during the webinar as we will monitor questions throughout the presentation and try to answer as many as possible during the Q&A period. Also on the left sidebar, please note the resources tab. Click this tab for a link to today's handout, a PDF copy of these PowerPoint slides. Select the file name to download the handout. Lastly, in the lower left of the player, please note the request support button. If you experience any technical problems during this webinar, click this button. A technical expert will be there to assist you with any issues you may have. For those who like to take notes during the presentation, look to the right of the slides and click the notes tab. There you will see a white text box where you can take notes on today's webinar. These notes will be emailed to you automatically at the end of the session. To be eligible for the SNMMI Voice Category A CE credit, you must be registered, logged into this webinar, then complete the survey. The link to the survey will appear on your screen automatically at the conclusion of the live session and also be available from the IAC webinar portal for three business days. If you are viewing this webinar in a group, please be sure you are also individually registered and logged into this webinar on another computer or device so that we have record of your attendance today. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be posted at a later time for on-demand viewing. And now I would like to introduce today's guest presenter, Dr. Jennifer Stickle. Dr. Stickle is currently a medical physicist for the Colorado Associates in Medical Physics in Colorado Springs, Colorado. She also serves as president on the IAC Nuclear Pet Board of Directors as a representative of the American Association of Physicists in Medicine. In addition to AAPM, she is also a member of the Society of Nuclear Medicine. She lives with her husband and two kids in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains a true expert in the field, and we are happy to have her with us today. And with that said, I will now turn this webinar over to today's speaker, Dr. Jennifer Stickle. Doctor? Thank you. And thank you everyone for joining us today to talk a little bit about quality control here in the middle of the day. Um, appreciate you taking your time and hopefully you find this uh, interesting and learn a few things, um, but please do, um, as we mentioned, add any questions for things that might not quite be as clear as they could be. A little background about me, just so you know who's who's talking to you today. Um, I got my PhD in biomedical engineering in 2006 from UC Davis. I was in small animal pet imaging design. Um, from there, I moved on to be a nuclear medicine physicist at the medical center there at UC Davis. Um, had the opportunity to work with some wonderful techs and some wonderful physicians to really get into the clinical aspect of things on the nuclear medicine side and to start a pet program. I've been a medical physicist with Camp Physics since 2007. I got my certification in medical nuclear physics from the ABR in 2010, and then in diagnostic medical physics in, well, that should say 2012, wasn't quite so recent. Um, and then abs and certification in instrumentation in 2018. So I've been working on these uh, pieces of equipment and working on QC concerns for quite a few years here and really enjoy it. So today's talk, we're going to talk about the requirements for what is QC, what is quality assurance, um, and then go into some of the tests, looking at both NUCMED and SPECT, as well as PET, um, talk about some of the tests, how do we do them, where are some of the pitfalls that we could find, and when at all possible, what would the effects be on images, and what might accreditation look like, whether it's with IEC, the Joint Commission, or um, some of the state uh, requirements as well for your license. So if we go to ISO 9000 and say, what is quality control, quality assurance? They're slightly different. We often use them interchangeably. But quality control, or QC, is the operational techniques and activities that are used to fulfill requirements for quality. So this is testing that you're going to do or reactive to seeing something that is um, potentially causing an issue in your images. 
Quality assurance is a planned or systematic activity that you do to provide adequate confidence that things are working properly. So this is looking more analytical and it's also proactive. It's doing something before you notice the problem so that it isn't impacting you clinically. So if we focus here mostly on QC in this talk, um, what are our requirements for QC? We need some equipment. You're gonna have a flood source for spec. You're gonna have probably a bar phantom. You may need to make some point sources. Uh, you may want to look at a JZAC or other image quality phantom. And you're gonna have your dose calibrator. All equipment that we're gonna use at various points. For pets, slightly different. You're gonna have some form of a standard source. It could be a rod, it could be a line, it could be um, a cylinder source. More and more um, machines are going towards the cylinder source. You might have a uniform fillable phantom that you can add activity to. In the world of PET CT and often in spec CT, you're gonna have a CT phantom. And again, we're gonna look at a dose calibrator. One of the most important things, and I'll mention it a, long, a number of times as we go along here, is the documentation that's required. You really want to have a step-by-step -step manual for each test with how often you're going to do it and what values you're looking for that would be considered pass or acceptable. Uh, you want this so that if you get a new tech or somebody ends up sick or out for a little while, that somebody else can step into their place and, and be able to do the test the same way and ensure that the machines are working the same way. We want to make sure that we have dated records of the results from all your testing, along with a log of any problems or service records that you might have with your machines. Um, and it's also important if it isn't already in your step-by-step -step manual that you understand what your manufacturer specifications are. There's some universal kind of tips and tricks, but most manufacturers have spe specifications for each piece of equipment. All right, so let's dive into Nuke Med Inspect. Here's just kind of a listing of the tests we're gonna kind of go through today. Some of them are fairly standard, uniformity, system alignment, or your center of rotation. Um, intrinsic or extrinsic spatial resolution and linearity. And then there's some other ones that are performed a little bit more ad hoc or if there's a problem um, that we might talk about here as well. So starting with uniformity, um, looking at intrinsically, so we're gonna pull the collimators off. The idea here is that we're gonna isolate our testing to just the crystal, the PMT and the electronics. So really the kind of the guts of the detector, if you will. We're gonna make up a small, less than 100 mic point source of tech. And we're gonna to try to get four to five field of views away from the detector face. So you really wanna make sure that you're, you're pulling that source away from it and not having it too close to the detector. You'll set up to take an image with about a 15 to 20% window, depending on how you use things clinically. And we're gonna to look to acquire a minimum of two and a half million counts. In reality, you wanna look closer to 10 million counts. So if we set all these up, um, the advantages here is it's relatively inexpensive. You can get, you know, tech, just some leftover stuff that you might have from a clinical day, um, or you don't need very much to get to get this test done. It's very relatively low radiation dose exposure, again, because we're only using 100 mics. And we're really testing the camera system with tech, which is the isotope you're using most often. The disadvantages here is we don't have the collimator in place, which is not exactly the clinical imaging situation. It can also sometimes be time consuming to try to get those detector heads positioned properly and evenly with the source on it. And it may not always be quite possible to get that five field of views away. <clears throat> so you have to make sure that you have enough room in your imaging uh, room to get that proper geometry. The other disadvantage that I don't particularly like doing is the risk of damaging the crystal. Once you pull that collimator off, you don't have that protection for the crystal. So you have to be careful and aware of what's going on. So our other alternative, right, is to leave the collimator on. Let's do this extrinsically. So benefits here is we're testing the complete detector assembly um, in a very similar clinical situation that you would be seeing every day. Um, often we'll use a solid uh, cobalt disc or sheet source that matches the size of our detector. It's also possible to use a refillable plastic sheet source with tech. Just make sure you mix that source very well. Again, we're gonna keep about the same energy window, 15 to 20%. Um, and acquire about the same number of counts. So the advantages of this setup is that we are including the collimator now in all of our, our checks. We also typically can acquire both heads at once because we can line, them, uh, line the sheet source up in between the two of them. Some of the disadvantages if you're using a sheet source is they can be expensive. And in today's 
world where we're looking at everything, sometimes management box a little bit about how often they need to be replaced when it's every one to two years so that your QC isn't taking you an hour and a half every morning. The alternative, you can go to a fillable source. Um, however, that does increase the time and the exposure um, while you're filling it and while you're mixing it. You also have to be careful that that plastic doesn't distort things um, and lead to poor mixing or an air bubble. And there's certain tech solutions that can adhere to the wall of those sources leading to a non-uniform source no matter how much you mix it. So either way, once we have our data, we've acquired it intrinsically, extrinsically, however your facility chooses to use it. First thing you wanna do is take a look at that image. Look for artifacts, look for structures or noise that's more correlated. And you can feel free to adjust those window width and window levels to really try to magnify those differences. It might be fairly subtle, and that's when we want to catch it before it's really propagating out into our images. Most modern systems now will also have a quantitative uh, window that'll pop up and that you can analyze your image with. Uh, you may get integral uniformity, or you may get differential, you may get both. Some of the small differences, the integral is really the largest variation in counts over your entire field of view. So whether that's the useful field of view or the center field of view, um, it's looking at the maximum pixel and the minimum pixel and what is that difference. The differential uniformity is looking over a smaller range. So it's looking for generally five pixels in difference and looking for what is the maximum pixel difference, either X distance, Y distance, or overall the worst count rate change over that distance. So again, we wanna do this daily and you wanna do it prior to use on a patient ideally even prior to injection. That gives you the confidence that your camera is, is ready to go for the day. So just so that we're all on the same page, this is an example. Um, this comes off of a Siemens camera that has a, a point source that's gonna come out. So it's acquiring a flood, you can see here, uh, very hot in the center and goes out. It does a curvature correction, knowing that this point source is not five field of views away. It curvature corrects it to the center um, images there and then those are the ones that it analyzes. So off to the right you then see your central field of view and your useful field of view and your integral and differential um, analysis from those images. So those are the numbers you're kind of going to look at every day and if they're starting to creep up or if they're getting above between five and six percent depending on what your manufacturer spec is you're probably going to need to get that camera serviced or do a high counts flood correction on it. So just what are some of the impacts here? Why do we do this every day? Um, Non-uniformities can lead to ring artifacts if you're doing SPECT imaging. So you may not see it right away on a planar image, um, but in a SPECT image, it's gonna show up with these rings as shown on the image on your right. And this is due to unequal pixel weighting when it's doing the reconstruction. A high noise level in your image would tolerate slightly larger non-uniformities just because the noise is gonna map out some of those. If you do have poor enough um, uniformity, you will start to see it in planar images as well. I showed just some lung images here. Um, these are actually abnormal clinical images, but the one on the right, I have seen in a camera that had very poor uniformity, something that looked very similar to that. So it can mimic or obscure pathology, depending on how bad of a uniformity um, effect you're seeing. So what are the accreditation requirements for this? It's a daily test. Um, most state regulations are gonna call for a daily test and most accreditation bodies are gonna call for this to be done daily. It may be required to submit pictures or policies and procedures on how you're gonna do this. Um, and so I would also check with your radioactive materials license to see what kind of documentation and requirement they're gonna have. I know our state in Colorado asks to see these um, if you are accredited or if you're not. So that's a kind of our daily test that we're gonna look at on our cameras. The next test that, that is often done, uh, our center of rotation or our system alignment tests. The idea here is we wanna make sure that the center of our camera image is uh, matching with the center of the computer generated reconstructed image. The idea is we're gonna measure the offset and angle of our data as it goes around in a spec image and correct the tomographic data properly. Sometimes this is just small differences in head tilt or the collimator holes, gantry alignment. Um, all of these things kind of get wrapped up together and we map it out. This is very dependent on which manufacturer you have. If you need one point source, if you need three, if you put it in the middle, if you put it in a special holder off axis. Um, so make sure you're following your manufacturer's specifications so that the analysis is correct and the calibrations that it might do off those data um, can be applied properly to your data. 
Um, the other thing to check is to see, you may need to do all head configurations, whether you have an L or an H, you know, configuration for your heads. You may also need to do it with various collimators, um, all very manufacturer specific, but the minimum would be to check the COR error weekly, potentially monthly, and to recalibrate it if the offset is greater than about half a pixel. Just because I'm a physicist, we got to look a little bit about why and what's going on with the center of rotation. The idea is if we had a point source right in the middle of our uh, field of view here with our circle, in the transverse direction, the point source should sweep out a sine wave shown on the bottom. In the axial direction, the location should remain constant. So if we're assuming that our source is in the middle, we should get a sine wave in one direction, a line in the other direction, and any deviation from that is going to be something that we need to correct so that our data lines up properly. So what can happen if we're off? I mentioned we need to correct it if we're about half a pixel off, um, and that doesn't seem like very much, but we're really looking at a loss of spatial resolution in our images, and it's easiest to see this on the point source image on the upper, um, the upper image here off to the right. Um, the top left dot is our point source. So you can see it's not teeny tiny, but it's got, you know, it's a, it's a relatively contained point source. The one right next to it, it's only a center of rotation error of 0.4. And you can see it's, it's blurred out a bit. It's a little bit bigger. As we start to get down at the bottom, 1.4 pixels, it's quite a bit bigger and you're starting to get a cold spot in it. Once you get up to 2.4 pixels, a very large COR error, you can see you got a cold spot in the center, a hot ring around the edge, and it no longer really looks like a point source anymore. So we're really blurring it out and we're changing its shape and its features. So these things can start to mimic pathology. Um, you know, that's a fairly small point source, but if we looked at a little bit bigger, um, down at the bottom, I know thallium isn't, isn't our favorite for a cardiac study, but this is the best um, errors that I had. Um, when the heads were aligned, COR of zero, there wasn't really an artifact seen in that heart, but you can see down at the bottom left or bottom right image, the COR error of 2.8 pixels starts to look like there's a defect on our heart. So now we're starting to introduce pathology into our study because our heads are not aligned. And this can be especially accentuated if you're using the 180 degree head alignment in a cardiac study. So onto the accreditation requirements for here. Um, testing is required, again, as per your manufacturer's timetable using their methods and analysis. If you can't really find that, you can't find your manual or whatever, if in doubt, do it at least monthly. And if you have a set of collimators, for example, your medium energy collimators or high energy that you don't use frequently, don't, you don't feel like you have to spend the time all, you know, every week, every month to make sure that they're done, but they will need to be done prior to a patient exam and pass so that you have confidence that your data is properly corrected. All right, the other common um, QC procedure that we're gonna do here is spatial resolution. And again, this can be intrinsic or extrinsic, depending on if you want your collimators on or off. Slightly faster if you take them off, but again, you're risking your crystal. Um, so in order to do this quantitatively, you really need some specialized um, equipment and software. Um, the simplest method is just to use a bar phantom. So we're gonna put the bar phantom on there. We're gonna rotate it every week that we do it so that that way every quadrant of our image is being checked with the highest resolution bar pattern. Um, and we're just going to look at it. Do you see wavy lines? Can you all of a sudden not see a quadrant that you were able to see for the last four weeks? Um, quick weekly visual check. Um, you have to do have to be aware if you're doing this extrinsically with your collimator, you could get the moiré pattern from the collimator. It's just kind of that aliasing artifact. Um, and as long as it remains constant, um, then that's that's what your images are and what you're expecting. Um, the nice part about using this bar phantom is you can also look at spatial linearity at the same time. So here you're looking for, are my bars wavy? Um, this one here, you can kind of see, especially if you look at the largest bar quadrant there, they kind of do a little wave as they go along. They're not perfectly straight. Um, so this is kind of, it can show you some of the bar patterns. Um, it can also show you damage in your collimator. Um, if you have software available, you can look at a quantitative method, but mostly we just look to make sure that there isn't a warp. Sometimes also you might not see it in the uniformity image, but sometimes you'll see a PMT tube show up on the bar phantom just because of the high contrast that there is. So resolution and linearity with this bar phantom usually is required weekly. Um, 
Some of the newer manufacturers are not requiring it and they are not necessarily providing a bar phantom. So be aware if that's what your manufacturer's um, recommendations are and make sure that you're documenting it. This is especially true with some of the new CZT multi pinhole cameras. Um, you just can't, imaging bars doesn't make sense on those cameras. So it's not an option. If that is the case, if you don't have the bar phantom, if it's not um, something that your manufacturer is recommending or allowing, please check with your accrediting body, whether it's the state, the Joint Commission, um, IAC, um, so that you can document this and make sure that you're still um, meeting up to their standards that they're looking for. So those are the standard um, tests that you would do as QC, daily, weekly, monthly, kind of as a tech. Some of the other ones that are a little bit more well used that I wanted to talk to, um, that we use a little bit more as physicists for problem checking and helping. First would be the pixel width calibration. So we often are measuring things quantitatively on our image, whether that's size, distance, um, angles, that sort of thing. And electronic drift, whether it's the PMT gains, the ADC gains, some of the other electronics, um, you may notice that it's not quite what you expected it. The size, the distance um, didn't quite match what you expected it to be. So we can check this, right? We can, we can set up two sources that are a known distance apart and make sure that if we set them as 25 millimeters apart, is my software measuring 25 millimeters apart? There is usually calibration software built in that if you know the distance, you can set that in your software. It's not a required test for accreditation, but it's again, used for troubleshooting. So just an example, one piece of equipment that you can get is this point source holder that's got um, predefined holes in it that you just take planar acquisitions with the collimator in place, repeating in both the X and the Y directions, um, and then measure it on your processing software. Relatively quick and easy, um, mostly done if your numbers just are not coming out as you expected. Another um, test that's more and more required, at least Joint Commission and some of the other accrediting bodies, is a count rate performance. Um, the idea here being at super high count rates, camera dead time can affect what your measured activity is. So especially if you're doing like a first pass study, um, if you inject 25 millicuries, your camera may respond just fine. If you inject 30, you may be swamping your camera and actually getting less counts out than you would anticipate. So you added an extra five millicuries that you're not able to get the counts off of. So we wanna look at an accurate measure of the dead time and determine what that maximum count rate is um, to find out what is the maximum activity that you should be um, using in your cameras for those first pass high count rate studies. Typically the way this is done, um, often the physicist will come in and do this for you. They'll have an acrylic block with a couple of holes drilled in it. We'll fill two tubes or two syringes with between 10 and 20 millicuries of tech each. We'll place them on each of the count on, the uh, camera faces, put one source in, put the second source in, put both sources in, and measure that a couple of different times, and then use our formulas shown here, um, which very nicely program into Excel most of the time, to, to look at how is your camera performing. And it's one thing to be able to know, you know, I can put 35 millicuries in front of my camera and it's just fine. It's another thing that we track over time, and as cameras age and as your crystal ages, this will start to drop and eventually it's at a point where you'd like to know that it's dropped far enough to make sure that you're using your camera properly. Again, count rate is not something that's typically required for submission for an accrediting body, but it may be done by a physicist as part of an annual camera check just for health of your system or an acceptance testing of a new unit to make sure that it's functioning as the specs are that you bought for it. On to sensitivity. Um, again, this is another one that we look at to track over time and make sure that this isn't changing over time. Sensitivity measurements are very dependent on which collimator we're using, what the energy windows are, um, what isotope you're using, um, and all the other detector properties. But a change in sensitivity, either up or down, indicates something has changed in your detector. So if the sensitivity levels are dropping, that means that you could put 25 millicuries in there and you're getting less count rate out. An increase in sensitivity, again, means that you're going to get more count right out. So it can make it harder to compare longitudinal studies. If you had somebody, you know, coming back to do a heart study a year later, it can be a little bit harder to uh, compare for the radiologist. Typically, the way this one is done is we take a flat disk source in some sort of fillable container. This here's a cell culture flask that's got a nice um, cap on it that screws closed so that we don't get any contamination anywhere. 
Um, and we'll fill that with between 100 and 200 mics of tech with a little bit of water so that it's a little bit more distributed, not quite a point source. And we're gonna be very accurate in trying to record our activity level measured in your dose calibrator. And then you can take a one minute planar image and you can look at what are the counts that you get per second um, versus the activity level in, in this little source. So it requires some ROI drawing around areas of the source and an area of the background and looking at what is the response of your camera. Again, for accreditation, similar to our count rate performance, this is not required typically to be submitted um, or images of this, but it will likely be done by a medical physicist as part of your annual testing or acceptance testing of your machine. Um, Briefly mention angular alignment, and this is just making sure when you tell the heads to go to 0, 90, 180, that your, your machine is going there directly. Quick, simple bubble level test, usually only done on install or if you've had major repair on your heads. Um, it's good to check just that all of the mechanical aspects of your machine are, are moving the way you anticipate them to move. And finally, one that I had talked about for a while, but relatively recently um, saw a good um, example of this that I unfortunately wasn't able to get the images of, but the idea is rotational uniformity. Typically when you measure uniformity in the, in the morning or um, as you do overnight for your cameras, you're measuring with your heads either at you know zero and 180 or something like that, but we don't always check them at other angles as they would rotate around during spec. So if you had, for example, a magnet nearby, that might change as your heads rotate. Or if there's poor op optical coupling between your PMT and your crystal, as you rotate around, that PMT might pull away from your crystal and you're gonna get a dark spot that you didn't see when the PMT was just with gravity pushed up against the pixel or up against the crystal. So this uh, I should be checked once a year if there are problems or something suspected. Um, in the case that I had here, the methods that we used was to tape a sheet source on there, lots and lots of tape so that it doesn't fall off. And then you're gonna acquire high counts floods over 360. So you're gonna look at zero, 90, 180, 270 and 360. And, and just look, you can visually look to see if they're the same. If you have the ability to subtract images, you could subtract them and see if anything changes. Um, the case I recently had, we had a screw stuck under the collimator between it and the crystal and it had bent some of the collimator. Um, septum over, it had been mapped out in the high counts flood, so it was just fine at zero and 180, but as it rotated, that screw shifted ever so slightly, and so we were getting partial ring artifacts, inspect images, that took a while to figure out until we pulled the collimator off and we just happened to be wheeling it across the room to put it kind of in storage while we did some intrinsic stuff, and the screw fell out. So we were able to find out what had happened, but, um, this rotational uniformity kind of helped clear us in too. All right, and then kind of the last systematic QC procedure that you can do inspect is looking more at reconstructed image quality. And so this is using some form of a phantom with known structure. So you don't want to just be uniform, um, but something that has some structure in it and really looking at overall assessment of system performance. Ideally, this would be evaluated every three to six months just to make sure that your machine is functioning as expected. Using it to look for things like noise, artifacts, contrast resolution, spatial resolution, um, and just tomographic image performance. A Couple of phantoms that may be used, and there's a lot of other ones out there as well. Um, you can use a JZAC phantom here shown on the top. It's got some cold spheres. It's got cold rods down at the bottom. So you can look at contrast, you can look at resolution, and there's a nice uniform area. There's the Carlson Phantom down below. Again, it's got a couple of more inserts, but similar idea. It's got a uniform section, a hot section, a cold section, rods, spheres, that sort of thing. We're gonna fill them anywhere between eight and 20 millicuries of tech, depending on how new your camera is, how small your camera is. And then we're gonna acquire tomographic images. Most of the times under ideal conditions, um, using a minimum radius of rotation, high matrix, high counts, high views, really looking for what is the best performance of your system. We can also acquire images under more typical clinical circumstances just to help get an idea of how your system performs under clinical conditions as well. I'm just taking that JZAC as an example. You can look at the uniform section, checking for ring artifacts shown here on the left image, 
proper attenuation correction. Both of these images don't have a hot ringer on the outside, so the attenuation is working. You can look at noise differences. You could ex um, experiment with different reconstruction techniques to see if something's better or worse. You can move down in the reconstructed image area, um, looking at these cold spheres. Um, and really looking at how many can I see? I can see four here. Maybe I can see five on a different one um, so that it's all there. It's all able to be seen. And then moving down in this phantom, we're down into the cold rods. So how small of an object can I see? Um, and is there any differences from year to year? So again, it's, it's something that you can use to look at longitudinally over time. Images from these phantoms may be required for submission. Um, they, there may be some requirement to hang on to them for six months to a year, depending on your accrediting body. And it really does provide a nice full evaluation of your imaging and reconstruction parameters, as well as quality of your display monitors. If you all of a sudden go to look at these on your display monitor and you realize that there's a burned in image because the monitor was left on for three weeks, um, you know, that might, might be a good thing for you to know as well. It doesn't test post-processing analysis software, so there's not a, you know, we're not going to look at ROIs and decay times and stuff like that. So it's not quantitative that way, but it does provide a bunch of other um, evaluations of your system. So in summary, for kind of our NukeMed and SPECT cameras, there's a large number of tests that we can do to analyze how these things are working. Some of them are daily weekly checks just to ensure proper functioning before we use them on um, patients. Some of them are more of a monthly, quarterly, yearly test to monitor performance over time and try to catch something that might be changing before it impacts our clinical images. One of the biggest things for technologists especially is looking at your clinical images. Do they look as expected? If you're seeing something that isn't quite right, raise the red flag, You know, get somebody else involved and let's get your camera fixed. One of the most important features of any QC, QA program is to make sure that the tests are done in the same way each time you do them. Again, this is your detailed procedure document. And remember, if it isn't documented, it didn't happen. Okay, so moving on, we'll jump into a little bit of PET here. Um, so here's just kind of a synopsis of a few of the things that we're gonna talk through, um, and we'll hit CT at the very bottom, um, since CT is a little bit more prevalent in PET versus SPECT all the time. So PMT gains, one of the uh, daily tests that you'll usually do or check. The idea is to electronically adjust the voltages on each one of the PMTs to make sure that those crystals are responding appropriately. Gains can drift because of temperature, power fluctuations, altitude here in Colorado can affect things. So this is typically done daily using vendor specific software and programs, not something that you can get nitty gritty on. Oftentimes at the same time, it'll do CTC or coincidence timing calibration. Um, looking because PET is so dependent on those two photons coming in at the same time, we really want to make sure that the years, there is accurate time information coming. Um, so after the PMTs may have been calibrated or adjusted, we want to make sure that we know what the time differences are in all our detector blocks. Again, this is typically done daily with the vendor software. You put your phantom on there and it's going to acquire all of these. And usually the last thing it'll acquire is coincidence and singles variation or energy resolution dead time using that standard source. It's just gonna kind of look at the results and the response of all of the detector blocks. The value shouldn't vary greatly day to day and it's gonna be part of our QC program. So if I just pull up here, this is an example um, from GE, because that's what I had available. Um, I have no preference on vendors. I was just grabbing one to show. So the gray blocks up on top are just kind of showing you the individual results, nothing super, you know, standing out. And then down below you have your numbers and the nice green indicator that everything is passing. So there's that. And then if we looked at another one from a different day, you can see here the arrows pointing to some black blocks that had stopped working from the day prior, which is up in the A block. So this here is indicating that there is something wrong with that detector block. We should be doing this before we're injecting patients because this here would be a service call that we need to go ahead and make um, to get our last ring there, the fourth ring of that PET scanner back up to full calibration. One of the other tests that is often done, it's a little bit more interactive with your system is GE calls it well counter calibration. I cannot remember off the top of my head right now what Siemens calls it, but sensitivity. And the idea is that PET is so quantitative, especially with F18 FDG, 
that we want to make sure that our dose calibrator activity is matching the activity that the scanner sees as well. So we're going to cross calibrate that activity concentration with the scanner and the dose calibrator. This may involve filling a uniform cyl cylindrical phantom with a known activity. It may be using your um, cylinder phantom that you use for QC that's already calibrated um, and just imaging it on the scanner and determining the, the scale factor, mostly for SUV calibrations. We want to check this monthly. Oftentimes, manufacturers will say every three to six months to redo the calibration just to make sure that those SUV measurements are accurate. At the same time, you can also use that, that scan and that phantom to look at sensitivity across your, your um, axial field of view. It's not something that's required. It's something that we'll often do once a year just to check and make sure that nothing is drifting and your scanner is maintaining its performance. Um, and the idea is that due to varying numbers of lines of response in each plane from the center out to the edges, values will fluctuate. Also, it's going to depend if you have a scanner that operates in 3D mode or if you have an older scanner that's operating in 2D mode, um, how well is your scanner correcting for that so that you get a uniform image across all of your bed positions. One of the other things that your scanner will often prompt you, prompt you to do is a normalization. So again, this is very similar to our flood that we do in, in SPECT, but we're going to account, um, acquire a high counts uniform image. Again, it could be a refillable phantom, it could be a solid phantom, it could be internal rod sources, and it's just going to correct out all of the little differences between detector blocks, between crystals, between electronics. Um, and this is usually done monthly on the cameras. Finally, I just wanted to mention CT image quality. Um, and because CT is used for attenuation correction in PET and more and more often in SPECT, we want to make sure that the CT side of our equipment is functioning as expected. So you want to make sure if you're going to be using your CT that day at all, you want to do your daily tube warm up and calibrations, fast cals or daily calibrations um, within Siemens or Philips. Um, it's also recommended that you put on some form of image quality phantom. It could be a uniform phantom to look at uniformity in CT numbers. You may also consider doing more advanced checks monthly, um, but those would be optional looking at contrast and spatial resolution. But just as an example off of a GE PET scanner um, using their uniform section of their phantom that comes with it, um, we're going to scan it, we're going to drop a couple of ROIs, which is fairly simple in their interface, and look at what is the mean value in the center and off to the edges, making sure that those are close to zero, as water should be, and that the noise is not drifting or increasing over time. It's important that the values of water be zero because as the scanner uses the CT data to correct the PET data, if the number of water drifts too much, then your attenuation correction of your patient images is going to start to drift as well. Some examples of a few of the other sections of those, those scanners, if you're looking to do some more um, advanced CT, QC, there's a low contrast part shown here in the upper image. That's just how small of a hole can you see in that? Um, and then in the lower image, we're looking both at slice thickness and spatial resolution over time. Um, and it's something that depending on the, the settings of your scanner, you're gonna record what a baseline measurement is and then just make sure that week to week um, this or month to month, this isn't drifting. So quick summary of the PET QC. Uh, most QC tests and checks in PET um, systems are done with vendor specific programmings due to the nature of the data processing and the calibrations that need to happen in the background. Uh, we wanna make sure that we're testing the CT or whatever other attenuation correction method you have. If you still have one of the ones that uses um, attenuation sources, you wanna make sure that you're testing that properly as well so that we're sure that everything's functioning before we inject our first patient. Again, we're going to review our clinical images for artifacts. If you're seeing something there, even if your QC in the morning looked great, if you see something on a clinical image, let somebody know. And again, documentation is key. Whether it's a checkbox, whether it's some other electronic Excel form that you, you document things were done, please just make sure you're documenting things. So in conclusion, um, a proper QC and QA program is going to include daily checks prior to our patient imaging to verify that our equipment is, is functioning and that we're happy with the images that we're gonna get off of there. We're gonna look at weekly or monthly calibrations or more in-depth testing, and then quarterly and yearly testing um, to look at performance variations over time. 
all tests, we want to do the exact same way to allow for comparisons. And I just wanted to add a comment here. Don't forget the requirements for testing of your dose calibrators, your well counters, and your thyroid probes. If you're going to be using those on patient imaging, um, those also have a set of QC that needs to be done and documented. So here, as you're downloading kind of the resources and you have these slides, there's a set of references here. Some of these are a little bit older. Many of these tests haven't changed over the years. Um, there's also some technical standards um, listed here that kind of will detail things out a little bit more um, so that you have them. You have some references there. Um, as well, my email, my phone number is on here. Um, if there is questions on here that we don't get to um, in the Q&A or if something comes up later as you're working in your clinic, um, please feel free. Send me an email. Let's talk through something. I'm always happy to answer questions. So, and I think we have Q&A now. Okay, thank you. And at this time, we will begin the Q&A session. From IAC, I'd like to introduce Maria Costello, Director of Accreditation for Nuclear Pet, and she'll be assisting with the Q&A session today. Maria, thank would you. you like to start us off? Sure, thank you, Kelly, and thank you, Jen, for the great presentation. Um, a lot of information in there and a lot of good information. We do have a couple questions that came in. Um, for the phantom, you stated a range of activity. Should the activity be a required minimum or maximum count rate dependent? Um, typically, yes. Um, you often want to think about how well your scanner can perform. Um, if you're looking at something like one of the newer CZT cameras, you may only need about five millicuries in there. Um, some of the older cameras can handle up to 30 and not have a problem with, with count rate performance. So it kind of, it, it's a balancing act between count rate performance and how long you'll need to image your phantom to get adequate um, images off of it. So I can't give you an exact number um, to relate to. It's kind of machine dependent. Okay, right, thank you. Um, another one. I just started a new job in a cardiology only department. My old job had techs who specifically did QC. So although I did daily uniformity, weekly bars, I never got to use the phantoms for spec. My new job only performs COR slash NCO, and we do not have a JSEC phantom for our spec camera. Should that be something that is required or is it optional to do? So most of the JSEC Phantom stuff is um, not required um, by state reg regulations or by Joint Commission necessarily. Um, so depending on you know kind of what your overarching regulatory body that way is. Um, now, from an accreditation point of view, there might be some slight differences. I'd refer you to those references. You know, IAC versus ACR or something. You know, some of the other sites may have requirements that way. Um, also, I would work with, if you have a physicist involved, a lot of times a physicist will have a phantom that they can bring with them so that your, your clinic doesn't need to have that expense um, on them necessarily. Okay. Um, so the next question is about CGT cameras. Um, I know for the IEC standards, we don't have anything specifically in there as far as um, what is required um, daily or, or monthly for the CZT cameras. Would you say that that is common or is it camera de de manufacturer dependent as to what is done um, routinely? Um, yeah. Or yeah, the CZT cameras are new enough um, and they, they're uh, complicated enough with how they're acquiring the images with those multi pinholes and stuff that they're very manufacturer dependent. So I would fall back on the manufacturers to look at what needs to be done and how to do it on those cameras. Okay, great. So um, this question, do the requirements set forth by the manufacturer on the Siemens Evo and Symbia meet the requirements just explained. Most of what was put forth seems to be performed during annual services. Um, do you wanna just go into what the routine QC is for spec cameras regardless of manufacturer? I yeah. Know, I know you addressed it, but maybe readdressing. Yeah, so you know your, your daily floods, those are gonna be required regardless. And again, that's something that the technologists are gonna be doing daily. Um, 
your CORs and COs, depending on manufacturer, how they call it, your, your center of rotation. Again, that's going to be something that you're going to do likely on a weekly basis um, there. Siemens, the newer cameras have gotten away from requiring bars. So those are the ones that I mentioned might not even ship you a bar phantom. Um, again, it's something I would highly, highly recommend. Um, you know, if you're purchasing a camera, getting that line item added in there to make sure you still do have a bar or using bars from an older camera, that is absolutely fine. Um, just because I think you get a lot of good information off of those bars, even just looking at them. Um, all of the other things I mentioned might be done by your physicist annually. Um, I don't know of very many field service engineers that do all this super detailed testing um, as part of their PMs. It's just not usually what the manufacturers say. Um, but again, it's not, not all of it is hard required by any regulatory body. It's just kind of good practice and it's good to be able to say, hey, my camera's starting to age and here's the data to support it if I need to replace it. Okay, perfect, thank you. How long are we required to keep QC records for accreditation? I was told up until the last state inspection. So I can answer the part about accreditation, but can you maybe touch on the different, or, or if there are different requirements for different states? Mm -hmm. um, that that is true. That the IEC only requires you, you know, we require you to follow your state, um, federal, and local um, guidelines. So, um, basically, for IEC purposes, up until the last state state ins uh, excuse me inspection. But is that some is that the same as to what's required for each? I know you don't know every single all 50 states, but for <laughs> most states. <laughs> yeah, for most states, that's true. Um, the state is going to, most states or the NRC is going to um, look at when they come for an inspection, they're going to look from the last inspection um, up until current time. That being said, I wouldn't necessarily just trash it all right away as soon as they walk out the door, just in case. But, you know, it, it's not a bad system if once a year you look back and say, okay, well, this stuff is beyond the last state inspection. Joint Commission, other accrediting bodies, IEC, um, everybody follows, for the most part, the state and the NRC requirements that from the last state inspection. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Another question here. I observed this at one time that a licensee used an extremely decayed cobalt 57 disk slash sheet source, less than 500 microcuries, decayed from five millicuries, and acquired the QC over an extremely long acquisition time to acquire the required minimum counts. Is there a minimum activity count rate that must be met to acquire a certain amount of counts or was this correct to use a very cold source and acquire over a lengthy time frame to acquire the required counts? Um, good question. And this, this can often come up you know, when you're looking at budgets and it's expensive to get a source, especially if a clinic isn't um, open every day or isn't seeing quite as many patients. Um, it, it, it does happen. Um, it's not good to get down that low. Um, when you're acquiring much longer than an hour um, in general, that's too long. I mean, you're going to have to come in early to do QC um, for an hour before you can even inject your first patient, ideally. And also the amount of noise that you're getting from, from just background electronics versus the true counts from the source starts to really creep up. So your images start to get very, very noisy, even though you still have technically the same number of counts. Um, so after about, um, for most cobalt sheet sources, after about a year and a half to two years, you really need to replace that. Um, otherwise, yeah, your time and your noise and your images is going up such that it's really hard to get accurate quantitative numbers. And then if it fails, then you're just pushed back a whole nother hour plus doing QC again to repeat it to see. So that's my recommendation. Not much more than two years old sheet sources. Perfect. Can the same JSAC Phantom be used to perform QC on Siemens and GE spec cameras, or do they have to be specific for each camera? The nice part about JSAC Phantoms is you can use them on any camera. So that's, it's a benefit you don't need. Um, there's not manufacturer um, or model specific JSAC Phantoms. And it's nice to be able to compare cameras, especially if you're, um, if your department has, you know, a Siemens here, a Philips there, a GE over here, it can be nice sometimes to compare image quality across them. You know, I image these with the similar parameters. 
and this one's great in spatial resolution, this one's a whole lot better in contrast resolution or something like that, it can help your department just to kind of optimize um, between the cameras. Okay, perfect. Um, so um, you mentioned several times documentation, documentation, documentation. Should images be kept as part of that documentation or should it just be um, like written documentation that it passed with um, the ranges or what do you recommend for that? Um, it can go a wide variety of ways. Um, if your packs folks will support it, sending QC images to a QC folder on PACS is always um, a perfectly acceptable way to document that. Um, if you are not going to save all of your images, which is perfectly fine too, check and see what your policies and procedures are that you submitted to your state or NRC for accreditation. Make sure that you're meeting, you know, if you said you were going to keep numbers, make sure you're keeping numbers. If you just said you were going to do a checklist, keep a checklist, you know, make sure you're meeting your own policies and procedures. Um, when in doubt, I say keep the numbers and keep a range on there so that you have, you know, June 14th, we did uniformity. Here were my numbers. Here's my pass fail limit down at the bottom. It was passed. I made a check mark. Um, most regulatory bodies will accept that as documentation that you did QC, provided you could pull up today's QC on your camera or you know, a week's worth of QC on your camera to actually show them that it was done. Okay, great, thank you. Um, one more question here. Um, can you explain again um, some of the effects on the images for center of rotation, especially for nuclear cardiology, if the center of rotation, things that um, you should look for when performing center of rotation and, um, how the 180 degree head alignment is and why, how and why that's important. Yeah, so when you're at, when, you, when, you're, um, when your heads are in, in more of the H formulation or you know, they're, they're opposite each other, you're, you're essentially double collecting data. You're collecting data from the top and the bottom so we can average out errors. So oftentimes center of rotation will average out a little bit more than it will be if you're acquiring them in a 90 degree orientation like you would for cardiacs. So a lot of times the center of rotation errors can be a little bit larger and a little bit more impactful in your images if you're not doing a full 360 degree rotation like you would in cardiac imaging. Um, and oftentimes that's gonna blur out your sources. So you're gonna get worse resolution. And then if you really have um, a big misalignment, especially between your heads, um, it's gonna start to introduce a cold spot in the middle of, it, of a point which is typically your heart in the center of field of view. So you can introduce artifacts that look like a cold spot on your, you know, on your heart. And depending on how you have it lined up, um, it could appear on different spots of the heart. Um, so that's one of the, one of the reasons you want to go through and really get the numbers off of that, you know, process it with your manufacturer's um, software and get the number, make sure that that error isn't falling outside of range. And if it is, there's almost always a calibration procedure that the techs can perform. Um, so make sure that somebody in your department knows how to perform that test to calibrate things when that COR is off, because you don't want to have to pull your camera down to wait for a service engineer to come out for that. Perfect. Um, so as far as the weekly uh, resolution or bar phantom, um, when they are wavy, I know you mentioned that that could pose a problem, but what um, what potentially could be the issue and is it possible that that could still be normal for that particular type of camera if one of the quadrants is wavy? Yeah, so um, one of the other reasons I like to do this once a week is because you get to know your phantom and there is some phantoms that just come and the bars, if you're looking at the end of the bar, sometimes they don't always line up or they shift in their little holders and the slots in the plastic holder. Um, so it's not always the end of the bars that you want to look at because those can be wavy just because the, the lead sheet in it shifted a little bit. Um, but some of them just, um, if you get them aligned just right with your collimator, you can get that, I mentioned the moire pattern. Um, and it's just kind of an optical illusion because of how they line up with the holes of the collimator. Um, so there is reasons that it can be a little bit wavy or a little bit strange looking that are totally normal. And it's getting to know that that's what 
your camera can look like. So if you're seeing that, I would take and just kind of take the phantom off and put it back on and you're not going to get it in exactly 100% the same spot that you got it last time. Um, and do just a, a quicker image. It doesn't have to be quite as many counts just to say, okay, if I realigned it a little bit, I turned it at a slight bit of an angle. Um, those, some of those artifacts go away. My camera's just fine. Nothing's changing over time. Okay. Um, one more question on um, if we are using CT as attenuation correction only, does that QC need to be done even though we're just doing attenuation correction? Um, Typically, yes, um, especially things like warm ups and calibrations. Um, because you're using the CT data to correct the spec data and you're changing your spec data or pet data based on that, you want to make sure your CT is fully functional and, and up to speed and ready to go. So typically, you're going to do your fast cals, you're going to do your tube warm ups, um, and then you're going to put on that phantom and at least look at what is the reading of water in the middle, making sure that that's close to zero and that it's not the noise hasn't doubled or tripled overnight. It can just indicate that your CT tube is starting to fail or your generator starting to fail or something like that and you're not going to get the corrected image that you want. Okay, perfect. Um, with that, that was our last question. Um, is there anything else, any other helpful tips that you can provide for facilities or anything besides documentation that's really important with their QC um, program? I would just make sure um, if you have multiple people helping you, um, that's not a bad thing, but just make sure that you have step-by-step um, -step so you know who's doing it which day and which week so that it doesn't get missed. That's the biggest thing I see is that it was like, oh, well, I was off on Thursday and, you know, Sally Jane didn't pick it up for me or Joe was supposed to do it and he forgot because it's not his normal thing. So just make sure that it's, it's very clearly identified within all the people within your um, within your group that you know who's doing what when so that it doesn't get missed because that without a doubt when that happens that's the day that the state decides that they want to see all of the numbers and that was the one day that got missed so perfect thank you very much i will turn it back to kelly now hey thank you maria and thanks again everyone and a very special thank you to dr stickle for her presentation today Please feel free to contact IAC with any questions that were not answered during the Q&A session. To receive continuing education credit for attending this webinar, please complete the survey. The link to the survey will appear on your screen automatically at the conclusion of the live session and also be available from the IAC webinar portal for three business days. On the left side of the My Account page, you'll click on Webinars. Look for the title of this session, Design and Management of QC Procedures for Spec and Pet Equipment. Beneath this title, you will click Review Event. On the left, select the Evaluations tab, then click Take Evaluation to complete the survey. Your certificate can then be accessed and printed from the very next screen and any time thereafter through the CE Transcript section on the My Account page. If you have any questions about the survey, please contact us at webinars at intersocietal.org. Once again, we thank you for joining us today and appreciate your participation.